Good evening, everyone. I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. And while we muddled through what I hope uh, will be the final weeks of this pandemic, I wanted to keep connected with all of you by holding another town hall. This is something I love to do. And I look forward to resuming in-person town halls as soon as we can possibly do that. And we have held so many town halls and forums on different subjects over the years, but I have rarely seen more interest in a subject than the one we're going to address tonight, safeguarding our democracy. Whether you are concerned about voting rights or election integrity or the ongoing threats that we face relating to the January 6th insurrection, almost everyone I talk to these days in every part of my district shares with me their concerns about whether we're at risk of potentially losing American democracy as we know it. I share that concern. It's a big part of what Representative Jamie Raskin, my guest tonight, and I have been working on for the past year and beyond. And it's why I wanted to dedicate a town hall to this subject. So we are fortunate uh, in this conversation to have a bit of a ringer with us to discuss this issue. I have so many talented and knowledgeable colleagues in Congress, but if I had to pick just one, to consult with regarding the Constitution and the legal and historical underpinnings of our democracy. If I only had one friend I could phone uh, to talk about the state of American democracy, it would be the incomparable Jamie Raskin. So before I invite Jamie to share a few opening thoughts, let me take a moment to thank the local media outlets who are sharing this program tonight. We're also being live streamed on Twitter and we'll make the entire town hall available on YouTube and on my Facebook page as well. And uh, here's how it'll go tonight after we hear some brief remarks from Representative Raskin. We'll dive right into a Q&A discussion. I'll be reading questions that have already started to come in from many of you. You sent them in advance of the town hall. And then we'll also get to some questions that will be coming in live on Facebook as we go forward. Congressman Raskin and I might pose a question or two for each other as we go along uh, as well. But mostly this dialogue is going to be driven by you. So with that, let me introduce uh, Jamie Raskin. He is a constitutional scholar, former law professor. He serves on a number of committees that are very relevant to our subject tonight. The Judiciary Committee, the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, House Administration Committee, perhaps most important for present purposes, He's on the select committee to investigate the January 6th insurrection, and he was the lead impeachment manager last year in the historic second impeachment of President Donald Trump. So, Congressman Raskin, Jamie, uh, welcome virtually to the second district of California. It's great to have you. Thank you, Congressman Hoffman. I'm delighted to be with you and the people of uh, California's beautiful second congressional district, and um, thanks for having me. It means a lot to me. Well, thanks for being here. Do you want to set the stage a little bit before we dive into a QA? and a uh, We're talking yes. tonight about safeguarding our democracy, and it does seem to be on everyone's mind. Well, um, <clears throat> there are obviously uh, hours of things that we can talk about in terms of the January 6th insurrection, but let me uh, try to encapsulate uh, things for everybody, uh, and we can use that as a kind of a launching pad for our discussion. But I saw essentially three rings of sedition taking place on that day and the work of both the impeachment managers in the second impeachment and also the January 6th select committee have really helped to give much more detailed texture to what I saw. But um, here's, here's what I imagine was going on. There, were, there was an outer ring that was a mass demonstration called by the president, you'll recall, for a wild protest. And that uh, ring of protest became a mob riot, um, which isn't to say that everybody there participated, but lots of people did. And of course, uh, 150 of our police officers from the Capitol Force, from the Metropolitan Police Department in DC, from the Montgomery County Police Department, which uh, is one of the departments that I represent as the uh, congressperson for the 8th Congressional District. And there were also people there from Virginia, from Virginia. 150 of them were wounded or injured with broken necks, jaws, noses, vertebrae, arms, legs. Um, people lost fingers, eyes gouged, uh, traumatic brain injury in a number of cases, post-traumatic syndrome for 
dozens and dozens of officers. Okay, um, so that was the the outer ring of the uh, of the action on January sixth. The middle ring was the ring of the insurrection, and here you found um, a couple of thousand people who were part of the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Aryan Nations, the militia groups, uh, the First Amendment Praetorian, some religious cults, the Unification Church was there. There were um, Christian white nationalists. These groups uh, had been preparing for a paramilitary assault on the Capitol. They were the first ones to smash our windows and to begin the violent assault against uh, our officers on that day. Believe it or not, that was not even the scariest ring. The scariest ring was the very inside ring of the coup. And it's an odd word I know in American political parlance because we don't have any real experience with coups in American history. And we think of a coup as something taking place against a president, but this was a coup orchestrated by the president against the vice president and against the Congress. And the whole purpose, of course, was to overthrow the result of the 2020 presidential election, which Joe Biden won by more than 7 million votes, in which he clinched in the Electoral College uh, 306 to 232. Um, Trump had uh, gone to Republican controlled state legislatures to urge them to void out the popular election and to substitute in pro-Trump electoral college slates. And to their credit, the legislative leaders in uh, several states, including Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, said no, they would not do that. At that point, um, Trump decided that they would go directly to election officials, and they approached uh, around 30 of them, including most prominently Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, simply to urge them to find more votes. And uh, Trump, of course, was caught on tape telling Raffensperger in Georgia, all I'm looking for is 11,780 votes. That's all I want. That was not Donald Trump trying to stop the steal. That was Donald Trump trying to steal the election um, and commit voter fraud with Secretary, Secretary of State Raffensperger, who um, was a constitutional patriot on that day. Uh, another unsung hero who said, no, he would not engage in that kind of voter fraud. So the whole thing came down to whether they could get Vice President Mike Pence to declare lawless, unconstitutional powers on that day to reject and repudiate and return electoral college votes to Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, at least those three states, perhaps Wisconsin and Michigan as well. But the idea was to get that 306 number in Biden's uh, column down to below 270. At that point, under the 12th Amendment, if no one had captured a majority in electoral college, the contest would have been kicked over immediately into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election. And you ask, well, why would former President Trump want the election settled in, you know, the the House of Representatives with Speaker Pelosi in charge and Jared Hoffman and uh, a bunch of free-thinking Democrats? Well, they understood that under the Twelfth Amendment. If nobody's got a majority in electoral college, it goes immediately to a contingent election where we will vote not according to one member, one vote, but one state, one vote. And so after the 2020 elections, they had 27 states in the GOP column. We have 22 states. One state, Pennsylvania, was split down the middle. So even if they lost um, the, uh, the the at-large representative from Wyoming, um, my best friend, uh, Liz Cheney, along with Jared Huffman uh, in the House of Representatives, they still would have had 26 states and they would have declared Trump the president. They um, he would have seized the presidency for four years. He likely would have come over and um, invoked the Insurrection Act and declared something like martial law in order to put down the insurrectionary chaos that he had unleashed against us. And that was basically the plan. Uh, and we lucked out in a number of ways. One way was that uh, Mike Pence upheld his oath of office that day. He was one who did. Another was that we had extremely brave police officers like Officer Goodman and Officer Dunn and Officer Fanon and Officer Hodges. Remember the guy who got caught in the doorway and was basically tortured in front of the world, Officer Gunnell. 
um, these people understood they were not just fighting for our lives and the lives of Jim Jordan and Marjorie Taylor Greene and the um, other just egregious politicians who won't even stand up for an independent inquiry into what happened, but they were standing up for democracy. And if you listen to our first hearing, I think you will understand that they knew exactly what they were fighting for on that day. And some of our colleagues who like to pose as defenders of the police or law enforcement uh, have been exposed as absolute frauds because they did not stand up for the police or law enforcement. Many of them have voted against uh, extending the Congressional Medal of Honor to these officers who stood up for us on that day. But that's another story, I suppose. But that's a general outline yeah, of what's great. happened. And then, you know, we've just been trying to fill in the details to figure out exactly what were the interactions and the coordination among these three different levels of seditious activity. Terrific. Well, that certainly sets the context for the January 6th part of our conversation on um, safeguarding our democracy. I know we're going to have some specific questions that will take us into other pieces of this concern, voting rights, voter suppression, election integrity. So um, why don't we go ahead and dive in uh, to the questions that we've received. And the first one uh, is about the select committee. Uh, David from Larkspur uh, writes in to tell you thank you that you're doing a great job. But he also wants to know um, about the, exp the outcomes that you expect from the committee's work, including the time frame. So maybe this is a good time to just educate us a little bit about uh, the purpose and scope and time frame of the committee's work and uh, what you expect to come of it. Thank you for your kind words, David. And the committee um, is working really round the clock. I mean, we meet pretty much you know, through the weekend and everything. Um, We've had overwhelming cooperation from witnesses. Um, we've talked to more than 400 people now. We have more than 50,000 documents. We've gathered an extraordinary array of video and photographic images um, and everything on social media as well. Um, the, we've only really hit kind of a, a bastion of obstruction and roadblocks right around the former president. And that's what's happened, you know, with Steve Bannon and Roger Stone and, uh, uh, you know, Mark Meadows, who's kind of doing the hokey pokey. He's got one foot in, he's got one foot out. Um, so that's what slowed us down. We were hoping that we could resume hearings and have a solid two or three weeks of hearings every day in March. It's looking more like that's uh, likely to be in April or May as we try to collect all the information we need. Then we'll issue a report to Congress and to the country where we explain the events and explain the causes best we can. Uh, and then we will talk about what we need to do to fortify democratic institutions all the way from um, the most street level physical reinforcement of the buildings, uh, the windows, the doors, and so on, all the way to what we need to do to fortify the voting system and our elections and so on. Uh, I mean, I wish we, I could say that the attack was over, but I think everybody knows that we're still in the middle of this, uh, as there are hundreds of voter suppression um, statutes around the country. Um, that, you know, there are hundreds more bills that have been put in, and there's an effort to centralize election machinery in partisan or state legislative uh, control. So there's a lot of stuff like that going on. And, you know, we had passed our For the People Act to try to overcome gerrymandering, to try to guarantee early voting, guarantee weekend voting, guarantee the right of mail-in balloting, and so on. Um, and, I'm going to come to that in a minute. Um, yeah, so we, we weren't able to get that through. Um, so, but all of this will, will, I think, you know, we haven't written our report, obviously, but I, all of this will be in there, what we need to do to fortify American democracy against authoritarian attack from the outside against our constitutional order. Okay. Uh, and some people may have the impression that this select committee, you know, they're hearing about subpoenas and criminal contempt charges and things like that. Uh, they may have the impression that this select committee can actually press charges against people who obstruct or uh, are found accountable uh, in connection with the insurrection. Can you just explain a little bit about how referrals and, and those uh, mechanisms work? 
Well, we have no um, no prosecutorial authority. We have investigative authority um, for the purposes of delivering this report to the Congress and to the people. We can make referrals to the Department of Justice the way anybody can make a referral to the Department of Justice. So that's not really any kind of special power, but we plan to make public everything that uh, we're doing. And, uh, you know, look, the Department of Justice is engaged already in hundreds of prosecutions. And uh, I know some people have been frustrated by the pace of their progress because like in most organized crime prosecutions, they're starting at the bottom. So they're starting, you know, at that level of the riot of trespassers and vandalism and refusing to leave and interrupting a federal proceeding. They're working their way up. So you know, we just saw the first indictments for seditious conspiracy handed down against Mr. Rhodes and the Oath Keepers. I think um, without any knowledge, but I imagine that that's just the beginning of a whole raft of prosecutions for conspiracy as they move closer and closer to the top of it. That's actually the next question I have. This is from uh, David in Mill Valley. And uh, we, we got a bunch of questions like this that came in on Facebook. People are frustrated at the pace of DOJ investigations. And, you know, are we on track uh, for holding people accountable that were part of January 6th? And so um, also questions about the fake elector scheme that we're just starting to learn about uh, where there is a DOJ investigation. Uh, the, the, the essence of these questions are, what has the Department of Justice been doing for the past year and how can we encourage them to get moving? So I'm going to be interested to hear uh, what you have to say, Representative Raskin, about that. But I, I will just say this. Um, I was encouraged by that uh, criminal sedition conspiracy uh, charge. That looks like a serious case. And I think it suggests to me that things may be heating up on the accountability front from the Department of Justice. I also know that this attorney general is very, very mindful of the fact that we just spent four years um, dealing with a Department of Justice that was kind of captured by a politician and really compromised in its independence and its integrity. That's third world stuff. We don't just dictate that our political opponents get locked up in the United States. So I know Merrick Garland is going to go out of his way to make sure that, you know, hopefully he will follow the facts without fear or favor. but. Uh, he's not going to do anything that he uh, or hopefully most of the country would deem to be politically driven or politically motivated. But what are your thoughts? I agree with that. But I want to think about accountability in two ways. One is individual accountability, criminal accountability. And I, I do think the DOJ uh, is rapidly accelerating um, its prosecutions and it's starting to get to some of the higher ups in these various conspiracies against the democracy. But we also want to think about institutional and public accountability, because that, that's really the mandate of our committee under House Resolution 503. What do we need to do to prevent a nightmare like this from ever happening again? How do we fortify ourselves ourselves against coups and against insurrections? Um, and so that's what we're looking at. And we need to educate the public about what happened. I mean, this was um, well, certainly we said at the impeachment trial, it was the worst presidential crime against the Republic in the history of the United States. And this was the worst violent assault on the Capitol since the War of 1812 and the worst violent assault on the Capitol ever committed by domestic forces. There's been nothing like this. So we've got to take it extremely seriously. And we need to deliver a report to the public about what needs to be done. You, you know, we, you know, we are in this project of democratic self-government, which Lincoln understood to be a very precarious kind of thing. I mean, for most of the history of our species, people have been spellbound by uh, bullies and tyrants and dictators and kings and queens and all of that. And it's America that started with the idea of we the people. And that's who we are. And we can't let go of that. Back to your committee, um, got a technical question. Norman asks um, about this issue of cooperation by witnesses. And I was glad that you mentioned that you've had dozens, uh, hundreds actually of witnesses that have cooperated that you have talked to. But what about the ones that claim the fifth? Uh, you mentioned you don't have prosecutorial authority. Do you have the ability to grant immunity so that a fifth amendment 
privilege would not be used or abused by people to avoid testimony? We can extend to people so-called use immunity, meaning that nothing that they say will be used against them uh, by us or any other governmental authority. So we would guarantee the, the secrecy and the closure of that process. Um, obviously, it, it creates certain kinds of risks in terms of people um, who are facing and should be facing criminal prosecution for what they did. But that is an option that is very much on the mind of our committee. Um, people do have a right under the Fifth Amendment uh, to assert the privilege against self-incrimination if they think they may have committed a crime and they might be incriminating themselves if they talk about a certain domain of subject matter. Uh, however, it is not a magic wand that you can wave over the whole proceeding as some of these uh, witnesses are doing. They go in and they just, you know, invoke the Fifth Absolute Amendment for immunity. everything, right? <laughs> um, and uh, much less is it um, a magic wand that Donald Trump can wave over his friends and they don't even have to show up. I mean, Steve Bannon didn't even show up. It's very clear under the Fifth Amendment, you have to show up and you use it in response to specific questions that might elicit a self-incriminating response. You, you can't just say, oh, I don't feel like going. I take the Fifth Amendment. Uh, if that were the law, nobody would ever show up in court at all. Um, and uh, the executive privilege claims, of course, have been slapped down by the Supreme Court, even the, the Supreme Court that Donald Trump gerrymandered, um, but by a vote of eight to one, they said there was basically nothing there to his executive privilege claim. The presumption is that if the president of the United States, here Joe Biden, says along with Congress right. that there's no uh, valid executive privilege claim, that stands unless someone can come back to show some extremely compelling reason to overcome it. And the court said, not only is there no extremely compelling reason, there's no reason that's even been offered. They've just said, well, Donald Trump wants to assert it. And then you have people like Steve Bannon and Mark Meadows that think it extends to them. It doesn't even apply to Donald Trump himself. I mean, we don't have under our constitutional system an office called the former president or the ex-president. You're done with being president. You are a citizen like everybody else. If you get called to testify, you come and testify, buddy. That's the way I feel about it. The uh, of, of some of these uh, obstructive arguments is just shocking. I mean, people who didn't even have a position in the executive branch trying to claim executive privilege. So uh, thank you for uh, clarifying that. I've got a question. It's a little bit of a different tack on safeguarding our democracy. Maria from Healdsburg is asking us uh, about the problem we have in trying to have an agreed upon set of facts in this country. I think she's asking about truth and wondering what certainly we as legislators, but also citizens can do to address this problem of sort of post-truth politics and post-truth uh, reality yeah. in the country. Um, I, I will hand it off to you, my friend, but I, I will just set the stage by saying, I think uh, as, as members of Congress, one of the things we have to do is just call this out whenever we see it and be part of the fact check, the national fact check uh, to sanitize our political debate. But I think it, it's going to take more than just members of Congress. It's going to take everyone uh, sort of reaffirming truth as, as a value that we care about. Well, um, and Jared, of course, can wax very eloquent on, on this point. But our Constitution was written by um, Enlightenment rationalists who uh, created the first constitution in the history of humanity that separated church and state, uh, precisely because the, the framers, uh, who were all of a very scientific frame of mind, like Ben Franklin and Tom Paine and Thomas Jefferson and Hamilton and Madison, these were people who wanted uh, public dialogue and discourse and decision making to be based on facts and on data and on political science. And so they were totally fine with people exercising their religious freedom and their worship, um, but not using it to dictate truth in the public sphere. There, they wanted it to be based on reason, empiricism, data, and so on. So what we're seeing today is a rebellion by certain quarters of the country against a rational public world, against the Enlightenment Constitution. And... Um, you know, one political party, to my mind, uh, is operating much more like a religious cult, where one person 
decrees what the truth is, and then everybody else goes out and repeats it like cult members. And I've said that directly to our colleagues across the aisle. I've said, if they continue the way they're going, they're gonna be fit only for selling flowers and incense at Dulles Airport before it's all over because they will, they've suspended their critical thinking skills and they've allowed someone else to tell them, oh, um, yes, um, Joe Biden lost the election to Donald Trump. Well, now that's the truth. And the uh, rioters confronted the police with flowers and kisses uh, and hugs on January 6th. Okay, well, now we'll go with that. It was a normal tourist visit on that day. Oh, and climate change doesn't exist and so on. So you see what's happening with this assault on science and rational thinking. So part of the defense of democracy is the defense of reason. Yeah, well said. Um, so Alyssa from Occidental is asking uh, about account a different thread on this accountability subject. She's worried that um, some who participate in the January 6th attack are now running for elected office. And uh, she wants to know uh, whether some of our congressional colleagues who supported the coup, the insurrection, um, can be prevented from serving. And it, it's an interesting question because my understanding, and you, you surely know this better than me, uh, Jamie, but um, the first test case of this is rolling out in North Carolina, uh, where our new colleague Madison Cawthorn, uh, very much uh, an ally of the insurrectionists, um, is being contested under North Carolina's state law that is a bit of a corollary. She's referring, Alyssa's question is referring to the 14th Amendment, of course, which in the aftermath of the Civil War was written to prevent people who took an oath to defend the United States and then turned around and were part of uh, the Confederate Rebellion to prevent them from holding office. Um, that remains the law of the land. Uh, it hasn't been tested very much, but it's certainly the law in North Carolina. And they have a unique twist where when someone is called out uh, for uh, an allegation of insurrection, the burden shifts to them to prove they were not uh, an insurrectionist. So what, what are your thoughts on whether one or more of our insurrection friendly colleagues might have some accountability? Well, the, the legislative history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is fascinating because when it came out of the House where the radical Republicans were massed and headquartered, um, what it said was that anybody who participated in insurrection or rebellion against the United States, and there, of course, the paradigm case in their minds was the Confederacy, but they said that anybody who participated in insurrection or rebellion would be disenfranchised for life. That would have disenfranchised hundreds of thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And when it got over the Senate, they said that sweeps far too broadly. Let's just zero in on the most egregious offenders. And those are people who actually served in public office, swore an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution against enemies, foreign and domestic, then violated that oath, betrayed the country, and participated in insurrection and rebellion. But even there, the Senate said, we're not going to disenfranchise them for life. We're just going to say they can never hold office again at the federal or state level. So they zeroed into that bullseye core of the biggest traitors to the country. And guess who falls in that category? Um, certainly Donald Trump does. I've got no doubt about that because we've got concurrent bipartisan bicameral majorities finding that he incited a violent insurrection against the union. And even though it's true, he beat the, the constitutional spread and we didn't make it to two thirds, but we still have a 57 to 43 vote, a majority vote in the Senate a majority vote in the House finding that he did it. And I think that should be sufficient to say that the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment should apply to him. Does it apply to other people? I don't know. That's a question of fact. And it shouldn't just be one for, you know, opining. Yeah, we will find out, though, as the facts are, um, as the facts come forward in that litigation, because Madison Cawthorn is going to have to sit for a deposition and he'll have the burden of bringing those facts forward in his case. That won't apply in some other states, but interesting stuff. I've got a bunch of questions, uh, Jamie, that come in about uh, contempt referrals and basically how uh, your select committee will deal with people who just refuse to come in and testify. Well, um, everybody owes us their truthful testimony. The Supreme Court has said that. Um, and 
We know that uh, an order coming from Congress to an individual to testify has the same validity and strength as an order coming from a court. It's the exact same thing. Uh, we have moved for criminal contempt um, against um, some people who have refused to testify. Um, and we may move uh, for civil contempt to coerce their uh, participation in our proceedings. Um, and it's also possible that we could exercise the inherent contempt powers of Congress. And we haven't said yet exactly what we're going to do, but I will just tell you that uh, I believe it is the sense of the committee that we should be using every tool at our disposal to get the evidence that we need in order to make this report to America. Thank you. So I'm um, going to switch gears here. Tom from Santa Rosa, I think, disagrees with you and me on, on much of this and, and has a different accountability question. He wants to know why there's no accountability for the riots across the country that did billions in damage and also killed people. He asks if we're picking and choosing which types of riots and violence to be upset about uh, based on politics. Um, I want to hear your thoughts, Jamie, but let me yeah. just say that, um, first of all, I think these are very different things. Uh, I think one of them involves property crimes and perhaps other type of, of unrest. Uh, and where people break the law in connection with that, they should be held accountable for those laws. Um, I've never suggested otherwise. But it does not involve a plot to prevent the peaceful transfer of power or over, overthrow our democracy. So they're really apples and oranges, and I'd like to believe we're not um, engaging in any kind of double standard. But what are your thoughts? Well, let's start with this. Uh, I'm a big champion, as I assume uh, the questioner is, of the Civil Rights Movement, which was a nonviolent movement. Uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and CORE, Dr. King, of course, the March on Washington. And uh, Black Lives Matter uh, also is a nonviolent movement that has embraced and endorsed nonviolence. If there's anybody who's engaged in property crime, or violence against individuals, they should be prosecuted for it. And I openly, enthusiastically support that. I assume the questioner openly, enthusiastically supports the criminal prosecution of the rioters and insurrectionists who beat up our cops. And I'm very happy to yield the floor to him to, to see if that's right. Um, but in any event, you know, the, the rhetorically, this is obviously an attempt to distract from um, the first violent insurrection that uh, delayed the counting of electoral college votes and interrupted the peaceful transfer of power. There are people uh, who say that what happened on January 6th was just like Dr. King. It was like a return of Dr. King's March on Washington. On the contrary, it was never part of anybody's plans there to be nonviolent. Uh, and to this day, Donald Trump continues to defend uh, and celebrate what took place there. You, you'll recall most recently he said, the election was on January 6th. The insurrection was on November 3rd when the election was stolen. So he continues to perpetuate that big lie. So I wish we could pursue the conversation in more detail, but uh, I, I assume that my friend is not raising this as a way to distract attention from this violent assault on America. Yeah, I hope not. Uh, but we do hear this moral relativism sometimes where, uh, and it's usually often invoked to try to get us to not take January 6th as seriously as, as we uh, do. Um, so I, I share your concern and your disagreement there. The same constituent asks about California's election integrity, specifically uh, the question, the fact that like many states, California allows third parties to collect uh, sealed envelopes with people's ballots and to turn them into elected officials. That's called ballot harvesting by some. And um, Mr. Schiff, the, my constituent, uh, suggests that it invites abuse that people could uh, only harvest the, the, the ballots that help them and take others and throw them away or alter them, and that there are no con controls. Um, I would just say there actually are controls. Anyone who does any of those things is committing a felony, and they're going to be prosecuted. In fact, the, the one case we know of where this happened at a significant level uh, was in North Carolina. It was a Republican trying to defeat a Democrat. And uh, that person was prosecuted, and they threw out the entire election and redid it. So I think there are controls, uh, but I also think we're at a time, um, especially during a pandemic, where um, strategies to make it easier for people to vote and encourage more people to vote uh, are a good thing, subject, obviously, to those controls. Any thoughts on that, Jamie? Um, yeah, just that. I mean, the 
the, the truth is that the way that elections are stolen in America is by people who run elections. And there's been massive disenfranchisement in our history, obviously against African-Americans, against women, against members of other racial minority groups, against students. Um, and this is where you know, election fraud has really taken place in the massive disenfranchisement of populations that have a, a right to vote that's being trampled. But the handful, you know, I've asked my staff to collect every case of real voter fraud that turns up from 2020. And um, I think it's running like three or four to one Trump supporters. One guy uh, murdered his wife and then cast a ballot for her right. um, saying he knew how, how she would have voted. So that does happen. And, uh, you know, they should add those charges on to the murder charges in that case. Got several questions about gerrymandering. Um, one of them uh, from John and San Rafael uh, is about the Supreme Court's decision that uh, basically polit political gerrymandering is OK, that racial gerrymandering is not. And I, apparently they're setting up this exercise of trying to divine the intent of the gerrymanderer to determine whether it is permissible or not. Um, others are asking about you know, what can be done um, about various types of, of gerrymandering. Uh, I know you're probably going to tell them about um, HR1 and S1 and the fact that we have passed legislation out of the House that would end partisan gerrymandering. What else uh, do you want to say about this subject? Well, there, there is that that we've been trying to uh, remove the situation where politicians choose the voters before the voters choose the politicians. Unfortunately, that's become a partisan thing, too. And, you know, the, the freedom to Vote Act and the um, For the People Act have been stymied because of the filibuster. But, um, you know, if you go back and you read those racial, so-called racial gerrymandering cases, Shaw versus Reno, Miller versus Johnson, under the name of equal protection, the Supreme Court basically said, you can't have bizarrely drawn majority black or Hispanic districts, but you can have bizarrely drawn majority white congressional districts. So in the name of equal protection, the court basically violated equal protection. But in any event, uh, it created yet another contradiction because they said, we, we know racial gerrymandering when we see it. Uh, and you know what that looks like to, um, you know, uh, these justices who are running the Supreme Court today. Um, but we can't tell what political gerrymandering looks like or what it is. Uh, and the court has refused to uh, acknowledge that it could ever be justiciable, meaning that nobody can bring a case about political gerrymandering anymore. So we're getting more and more states where you have a complete shutout. Um, the way it should work and the way it works in most representative democratic societies is if you have 55% of the vote, you end up with 55% of the seats or some rough approximation. If you have 45% of the vote, you get 45% of the seats. But with the tools of computerized gerrymandering, a sixth grader can draw a state so that a 55% majority becomes a 100% majority in terms of the congressional delegation. And that's what we're dealing with more and more states where it's a complete shutout, where you have, you know, all Republicans from Utah, even though Democrats are 40% of the state, or you get all Democrats from Massachusetts, even though there's a Republican governor, because it's very easy to draw the districts in such a way to have a complete shutout. So we're gonna to have to evolve beyond that, but it is obviously gonna take teamwork and cooperation between the two parties and the involvement of lots of people who hate both of our parties and want to upset the whole system, which has become obviously so rotten with uh, partisan vitriol uh, over the last several years. Yeah, yeah. I, I, having just come through my second round of independent redistricting, I think it's the only way to go, and it is what uh, our legislation that we passed out of the House um, would call for. So um, Brad from Sausalito uh, wrote in to express concern over the prospects of a 2024 run by our twice impeached former President Donald Trump uh, and the possibility then of another popular vote defeat but electoral college victory or shenanigans that might uh, function like an electoral college victory. So I think this question, uh, it, it's a long and technical question. I'll try to, to uh, synthesize it. He's asking about whether interstate compacts might be used to help resolve uh, our vulnerability to electoral count abuse. 
I think it's also raising the Electoral Count Act itself. And uh, of course, we have heard that there is this bipartisan group that may be working on an update of the Electoral Count Act from the late 1800s to try to spare us from another exercise where someone thinks the vice president uh, in that moment gets to go in and decide the, the viability or the credibility of the actual uh, elector slates from the different states. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, um, the very first bill I introduced when I was in the Maryland State Senate was for a national popular vote interstate compact. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, more than a dozen states, including California, have joined that compact to say we're in a coalition where we will cast our electors, not for the winner in our state, but for the winner of the national vote at the point at which we have at least 270 electors in the Electoral College Vote Coalition. Somebody who used to support this, by the way, was Donald Trump, who used to blast the Electoral College and said it made us the laughing stock of the world and how can the loser win and the winner lose. And then, of course, uh, the 2016 demonstrated to him the magic of the Electoral College uh, <laughs> as it was being practiced. Um, Wouldn't so, that compact uh, have to receive congressional approval to withstand challenge? It, it, it would probably need to need to receive it. And I think, you know, once we get to 270, I think it would be a matter of course for that to happen, I hope. But in any event, um, it does look like it's stuck in a partisan paralysis like everything else. We should do whatever we can to improve the Electoral Count Act. I mean, certainly we could formalize the vice president's role as uh, a ministerial one, if not a ceremonial one, at least an administrative one rather than a decision-making one. I mean, Trump was trying to convince Pence that he could unilaterally expel electors and just get rid of them. Um, I don't think we have to worry about Vice President Kamala Harris stepping outside of her role. And uh, Mike Pence, I didn't do it, but it would be worth doing that. It would also be worth it perhaps to raise the threshold of objection from just getting one representative and one senator to you know, 25 or 50 or right. something like that. I don't think any of these things is going to be a magic arrow right. that's going to solve our problems. As long as we've got a strategic bad actor who's willing to convert the entire electoral college system into a series of booby traps that explode in the face of the majority, uh, we're just going to have to stay extremely vigilant. I don't know that there's going to be a technical fix to what ails us today. I mean, we've got to defend right. democracy itself. And majority rule is so threatened by all of this, everything in the bag of tricks, the gerrymandering of our elections, the voter suppression statutes, the manipulation of the filibuster, which is not in the Constitution, which is not in federal law, the manipulation of the Electoral College and so on. So it's a race between the clear majority will on so many issues and on democracy itself versus all of these anti-democratic mechanisms that are being used against us. Yeah, we'll see if uh, Manchin and Susan Collins and others can actually come up with a 60 plus vote uh, reform of the Electoral Count Act. But I agree with you, even if they do, it, it, it's kind of small ball. Um, it doesn't address the types of abuse and dirty tricks that we're likely to see uh, in some of these Republican states, including um, simply nullifying or overriding the actual outcome of a given election and sending uh, you know what what might well be a an inaccurate slate uh, of electors to the house to be counted um any, any thought i've got several questions on that very fact that state legislatures are giving themselves potentially the power to override election officials and override the actual vote in their state uh, what can we do about that well <clears throat> um th that is an open question legally um you know, in certain Supreme Court cases like McPherson versus Blacker and Bush versus Gore, the court indicated that it's within the plenary power or the total control of the legislature. On the other hand, um, there are one person, one vote principles and Congress could act if we could deal with the filibuster because the Republican guarantee clause uh, means that we have to guarantee to every the people of every state a Republican form of government, not a Republican party form of government, but a Republican form of government, meaning a representative form of government where everybody's voice counts. So I think the wheel is still in spin on that one. Good. Well, thank you. Um, let's see. I've got a question about uh, extremism and, and right wing fascism, um, QAnon and other 
uh, fringe groups that um, are increasingly violent? And what can we do about that threat? Um, obviously, we know our intelligence community believes that this is now the top domestic threat uh, to our security, uh, extreme That's right. right wing violence. So uh, we've got to do more. Uh, what are your thoughts uh, from, from your perspective on the Judiciary Committee and on the, the Select Committee? Well, Homeland Security and DOJ have both said it is the foremost threat, and they have finally done something that my subcommittee on oversight, the Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Civil Liberties, uh, has been asking for for a few years, which is the creation of an independent unit to focus on domestic violent uh, extremism in the country. It, you know, for all of my colleagues uh, in the House who are defending the insurrection and for Donald Trump, I want to ask them, are they just defending uh, the QAnon shaman and people who beat up police officers, or are they defending the people who are now being prosecuted for seditious conspiracy and attempt to overthrow the government? Are they going to whitewash those crimes too? Because they've maintained a discreet and demure silence uh, up until this point about that. But as the charges get more serious, we'll see whether they try to disentangle themselves or whether they really go down that road of just saying, we're going to be a pro-insurrection, pro-coup party. Yeah. Another one of my, uh, my constituents is asking, um, what happens to your select committee and its work uh, if the Republicans take over the House next year? Uh, and that sort of, I guess, is a question about the timing uh, of, of your work, but also, I mean, look, if they, if they take the majority, I don't think anyone expects them to continue this committee. They fought tooth and nail against having an independent nonpartisan commission and now this bipartisan committee. But uh, what, yeah, what do you say? I mean, that, that's that's a self-answering question. I think, um, they, you know, they've said the first thing they will do is get rid of the committee. Um, this week, uh, Newt Gingrich uh, said that those of us on the committee are going to end up in jail for what we did. Um, yeah, and unlike uh, our attorney general, they still just jump right to lock them up, throw this person in jail and that person in jail. It's, it's just remarkable the terms we hear from. Yeah. Supposed leaders in the Republican Party these days. I mean, it's a fascistic way of thinking about it. But your point is right, Jared. People have got to remember that Kevin McCarthy and Mitch McConnell originally supported the idea of an independent 9-11 style outside commission with five Republicans, five Democrats, equal subpoena power. And we agreed to that. Our emissary from the Democrats, Benny Thompson, who now chairs our select committee, he agreed to that with John Katko, who was sent in um, by Kevin McCarthy. And then when we had the agreement, they went back to their respective bosses and Donald Trump told Kevin McCarthy, no, he didn't want any investigative commission of any kind at all. And McCarthy turned on a dime and said, we no longer support it. I mean, that's a pretty terrifying thing when you think about it. Um, and now the vast majority of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle denounce it as a partisan enterprise, despite the fact that it's as bipartisan as we can make it, um, because uh, it's just Liz Cheney and Adam Kinziger who will participate. But I got to say, it is the most effective bipartisan committee I've ever been on, because we don't spend all of our time in partisan invective and combat back and forth. We actually have a job to do, and we're doing it together. You know what it's like in most of our committees, Jared, where the first hour of every day we have to endure these ridiculous Offering. polemics, yeah. you know? That's true. You know, it's been remarkable for me to watch. Um, I've always kind of admired Adam Kinzinger, but Liz Cheney was someone I thought um, was my mortal enemy on so many different things and uh, never thought I would find myself admiring her. Uh, she has been a remarkable profile in courage uh, this past year. And uh, I wonder, this is not someone any, something anyone asked on Facebook, but I'm going to ask you, what's it like working with her? Well, you know, I've always liked Liz Cheney. We came in to Congress together. Um, she's a real family person. Uh, you know, she's got five kids and, um, and she's a lawyer. She's interested in the Constitution. So we've always gotten along. But really, I mean, I spend uh, more time with her now than almost, you know, any member. I mean, you and I are co-chairs of the Free Thought Caucus, the Free Thinkers, and we we haven't uh, had a meeting uh, recently, but I, I'm in January 6th meetings all the time. Um, she's terrific. And um, of course, there, 
they've made her into a pariah. I mean, I've been on the floor with her when Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, just starts yelling at her and screaming at her and calling her a traitor and so on. And uh, I noticed Liz has um, started to sit more, more and more over on our side of the aisle uh, just because they've made it so hostile for her in some precincts over there. Um, their Freedom Caucus, um, their so-called Freedom Caucus, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and Matt Gates, and those people really have wrapped themselves around Donald Trump, and they are attacking our constitutional order, by which I mean they attack our elections and our electoral outcomes if they don't go their way. I mean, that should be the foremost obligation of a political party in a constitutional democracy. If you win, great. Congratulations. You won. If you lose, you do better next time. I mean, the Democrats just lost a, a gubernatorial election in Virginia. We didn't storm the Richmond State Capitol and beat the daylights out of police officers and go out on the Internet and start lying about what happened. Yeah. You know, we sucked it up and we said, OK, well, let's look and see what we can do next time to refute their nonsense about critical race theory. Yeah. So uh, another one of my constituents asks, whatever happened in the Mueller report? Um, didn't um, Special Counsel Mueller um, leave some open questions uh, about obstruction of justice and other potential crimes? And what's next? Um, I don't know what, if anything, is left for Congress to do on that front, but certainly it's a fair question to pose to uh, our new attorney general, isn't it? Yeah, I think what happened to the Mueller report was William Barr happened to it. Um, he miscast it. He distorted it. He basically squelched it. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this is the difference between justice in theory and justice in the real world. In the real world, it's just almost impossible to imagine the current attorney general dusting that off and saying there are unprosecuted crimes here or there are things that need more investigation. I mean, life goes on and um, most crimes, of course, are never investigated or prosecuted. And, you know, the our GOP colleagues are calling people who, who are going to jail for assaulting police officers and trashing the Capitol and interrupting the peaceful transfer of power political prisoners. And they literally go down to the D.C. jail and they march around and call for them to be released. Um, well so, so, Jamie, I have a bunch of questions about what can we do, we meaning just regular folks, because it looks like uh, our ability to legislate prote additional protections for voting rights and against some of these dirty tricks we've been describing uh, is just running up against the limits of the filibuster. And we it doesn't look like we're going to get Senators Manchin and Cinema on board with changing that rule. So additional federal legislation is is unlikely in this election cycle. I think people are hungry to know, well, if not that, what do we do to defend against state legislatures who might simply throw out election outcomes and swap in new ones or other dirty tricks, rank voter suppression and other things? Um, I typically tell them uh, we're going to have to be lawyered up and we're going to have to challenge these things in court on what's left of the Voting Rights Act after the Supreme Court's Shelby decision, another decision, there still are some, some intact safeguards that can be used. Uh, there are groups out there who are lawyered up, uh, ready to fight. And of course, we're gonna have to probably work a little bit harder to get people out to vote and to overcome some of these obstacles. But I know you've given this a lot of thought. Uh, how do you respond to people that are wondering, you know, how we're gonna fight this fight? Well, it's an excellent, urgent question, given where we are. Um, I want to be respectful of the rules that bind us to yeah. talking policy rather than campaign stuff. But obviously, there are answers relocated in a campaign space about that. But look, um, you know, the great thing about our system with the separation of powers at the federal level and then the distribution between the federal and the state and the county and local is that there's always another arena to make the fight. And we have to defend democracy at every level. Um, so becoming an election ju judge in a county that needs election judges and to do, you know, a fair and neutral and nonpartisan job is an act of democratic patriotism, small d democratic patriotism. Um, and so we need to support all of our uh, democracy institutions that are out there from 
the press to the state legislatures and the city councils. I mean, even going to a school board meeting it's where true. there are right wing authoritarians who are trying to drive everybody out with polemics and vile insults and threats and so on to go and stand there with the people who are honorably serving as school board members and people who are going to talk about real issues. That is an act of democratic courage and yeah. civic engagement. So I think all of us have got to ask ourselves what we can do. And remember, sometimes people tell me, well, they're just burning out on this after so many years. Um, it's you only burn out if you feel like it's your solo responsibility. It's not. If you're feeling you need to take the weekend off, take the weekend off and go go to the beach in California and somebody will take your place. And then some other time you take their place. So it's about taking turns, standing in solidarity. We'll get through it that way. I really think we will. Appreciate that. I'm going to just squeeze in two final questions. We're nearing the end. The last one will be my personal prerogative to ask you something that I just want you and me to talk about, Jamie. But um, I've gotten a number of questions from constituents about, and I know you hear this all the time, uh, when will there be relief from this hyper-partisanship and vitriol? And you know, when will, frankly, the Republican Party you know, come around to be more like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger? Um, and you know, I will just say, uh, as I tee this up for you, uh, obviously, I'm a partisan. You're a partisan. We are passionate Democrats. We're progressives. But when the system is working, there's a constructive friction between the two parties. We have vigorous debates. This has been going on since the beginning of our country with the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. But we were all on Team America. Uh, we heard each other out and we acknowledged that even our political opponents uh, had valid perspectives and we needed them to be in the arena with us. Something has changed recently with the way the Republican Party, most of them, not the Liz Cheney's and Adam Kinzinger's, but the Donald Trump Republican Party, how they approach that most basic aspect of our two party system. They're well unwilling to uh, <clears throat> accept that we even have anything valid to offer uh, and they're unwilling to accept election results when they lose. So. Um, it's not a particularly hopeful time, and we've got this media uh, machine and social media out there where people have figured out how to make huge amounts of money off of the dysfunction and the conflict. Um, I, I don't have a single solution to how we break through that and end it, but I think all of us have to think about uh, how we make it better, and um, I want to hear your thoughts. Well, I think you capture my thoughts mostly. I mean, I will say that... Um, Every age almost believes that it's in an age of unprecedented uh, partisan vitriol and bitterness. Um, and you, know, you go back and look at even like Jefferson and Adams, who were best friends, but the things that they were saying about each other in that 1800 election, I mean, it was brutal. Um, and so it does go back to the, the Federalists versus the Democrat Republicans. And I mean, you can people hear, find people saying some nasty stuff about George Washington, who got all the electoral college votes when he ran, you know. Um, but having said that, um, there are moments when people do seem to step outside of the existing constitutional order. And you can find some of the hallmarks in it in the use and deployment of violence yeah. and also um, trying to question the validity of elections that have been upheld, as in this case, by more than 60 federal and state courts, including eight judges who were nominated to the bench by Donald Trump himself. They've rejected every claim of electoral fraud uh, or corruption. So, look, we know how to be nonpartisan when we want to. Um, you know, I'm sure if you call Congressman Huffman's office and you ask for help on a Social Security check or yeah. VA benefits or PPP, loan, whatever it is, he doesn't doesn't say, matter. are you a Democrat, a Republican, a Green, a Libertarian, Independent? Just says, do you live in my district? Because we're bound to just help people in our district. And then he goes to work. We know how to do that. And I think it's fine to fight like cats and dogs in the campaign. But when the campaign's are over and we're sworn to uphold the Constitution, we got to remember where the word party comes from. It's from the French word, parti, a part. And we got to remember our party is just part of the whole. It might be the part we agree with the most about how to proceed politically, but we represent everybody and we know how to do that when we want to. And we've got to 
think like that when it comes to the constitutional structure itself, because all of us are invested in it. And we've got to be nonpartisan uh, and vigorous, zealous in defense of the constitutional system. Yeah. And thankfully, we have a lot of allies still on the Republican side will disagree with them about lots of things, but they get this and they're going to work with us uh, in defense of the Republic. So we've arrived at the final question. It's a point of personal privilege that I get to ask this, Jamie, because uh, for my constituents, uh, you, you've probably figured out uh, Congressman Raskin and I are, are great buddies. We're friends and allies. And I think one of the reasons for this is that we are two of the staunchest defenders of the secular character of our government. Uh, we both feel strongly enough about that, that we co-founded this Congressional Free Thought Caucus. Uh, we've now grown it to 14 members, and it is sort of the vanguard right now in the Congress of pushing back against the encroachment of religion and would-be theocracy on the secular character of our government, the separation of church and state. Uh, so that's the setup. The question goes back to January 6th. I think one of the things that hasn't been talked about enough is just how much there was a theocracy agenda behind the January 6th insurrection, uh, a very clear one led by pastors and religious zealots, primarily white nationalist conser conservative evangelicals who want to get rid of all public schools. They've got a very clear agenda uh, that would just blast right through the separation of church and state. And put us uh, well on the slippery slope of theocracy. Uh, what are you finding uh, as you sort through what happened on January 6th? And I know that uh, working together in our Free Thought Caucus, we're gonna be exploring this in more depth, but uh, you know, wonder if you have some preliminary thoughts about how that played into the insurrection. Well, th there was clearly the, the presence of some of the dominionist groups and um, some of the fundamentalist Christian groups that have been Trump's most ardent supporters. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a delicate thing we want to say because um, obviously most religious people in America um, totally opposed what took place there and found it deplorable. Um, and a lot of great religious people were on our side. Um, having said that, there are what you properly describe as theocratic forces in the country who think that the separation of church and state is a myth or at the very least a bad idea. Um, and they want to reestablish um, the union of church and state. I mean, th this was the great insight of the framers to become the first constitutional democracy in history to rebel against the Inquisition and the Holy Crusades and the witchcraft trials and all of the cruelties of theocratic government. And up until that point, every government had merged with a church or monopolized a church um, to try to dictate to the people how they should think, pray, feel, uh, and engage in politics. And so our framers broke that up. And they said, you can believe whatever you want, you can worship however you please, but you can't seize state power for one religious idea and then dictate to everybody else how they should think and how they should believe and how they should feel about stuff. So when we look at what's going on around the world with the resurgence of authoritarianism, fascism, racism, anti-Semitism, all of it, um, there are generally really strong right-wing theocratic forces at play there. And it's the same thing in America. So you're right uh, to call it out. I, I always just want to be careful not, not to paint too broad a brush, of course. because a lot of those people's main opponents are progressive religionists. And yeah. I think that that's how we've made progress in America, a coalition between free thinkers and people who are on the progressive or moderate side of the religious spectrum. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So that's a great place to end. Uh, a reminder that when we talk about Safeguarding our democracy in America, um, safeguarding that separation of church and state uh, is part of it, maybe at the heart of it, actually. So, uh, Jamie Raskin, you're a great friend and a great uh, patriot and a leader in the Congress. Thanks for being part of a really important and substantive conversation for my constituents. And we'll see you in Washington next week. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the constituents of the great Jared Huffman. Take care. Thanks, everybody.